Good morning, Life Church of Orange. Are y'all blessed in God today? Come on, I came ready to give God the praise and give Him the worship this morning. You know, worship means to encounter God and praise Him. You guys ready to set your minds, encounter God, and praise Him this morning? In the Bible, worship is described as a lifestyle dedicated to God, and it's also the activity of engaging in praising, adoring, and expressing reverence to God. So that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to engage in our praising, in our adoration, and our reverence to the holy living God. He is here in our midst. Let's sing to him with our songs. Thank you, God. Let's honor him this morning. Bless you, Lord. We thank you, God. He is worthy. He is worthy to be praised. Thank you, God. Jesus greets with thanksgiving. Enters courts with praise. Give thanks to God and praise him. For the Lord, he is good. Come on, enter his gates. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Enter his courts with praise. Give thanks to God and praise Come on, he is good. For the Lord, he is good. Come on. Yes, he is good. Here we go. Shout the joy, all of the earth. Come worship the Lord. Worship the Lord. Come before him with joyful songs. For the Lord, he is good. Yes, he is good always. Come on, it's an invitation always. to worship him. For the Lord, he is good always. Always. For the Lord, he is good. Psalms 100 says, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. So that's what we're going to do. Here we go. Enter his gates. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Enter his courts with praise. Give thanks to God and praise him. For the Lord, he is good. Yes, he is good. Come on, shout. Shout for joy. All of the earth, come worship the Lord, worship the Lord. Come before Him with joyful songs, for the Lord, He is good. Yes, He is good always, always. For the Lord, He is good always. Just think of all the ways that the Lord has been good to you. Thank you, Lord. How he's brought you out of Egypt. How he calls you son and daughter. For the Lord, he is good always. How he's brought you into this family. How there's joy in this house. Never does a day go by without him by my side. He never walks away. He's with me. Never does a moment pass that I'm not in his hands. He is so good to me. Never does a day go by without him by my side. He never walks away. He's with me. Never does a moment pass that I'm not in his hands. So Come on, somebody rejoice!
I think we ought to sing this never does a day go by again because God has never left our side and sometimes we forget that we go through difficult situations and our faith is tested and we begin to doubt but the Lord has never left your side he's always there through thick and thin even when we turn our back even when we walk away from God he's there with open arms saying come back come to me so let's sing this never does a day go by without him by my side he never walks away he's with me never does a moment pass that I'm not in his hands he is so good to me never does a day go by Without him by my side, he never walks away. He's with me, and it does a moment pass that I'm not in his hands. He is so good to me. So good, so good. For the Lord, he is good.
God is fighting for us. Here we go. God is fighting for us. He's pushing back the darkness, lighting up the kingdom that cannot be shaken. In the name of Jesus, enemies of Come on, declare it right now. Shout it out. Shout it out. God is fighting for us. He's pushing back the darkness, lighting up the kingdom that cannot be shaken in the name of Jesus, the enemy yeah. and we will shout it out, shout it out. God is fighting, God is fighting for us. He's pushing back the darkness, lighting up the kingdom. God cannot be shaken in the name of Jesus, and I'm Somebody needs to say, I am healed in Jesus' name. I am healed in Jesus' name by the power of the blood of Christ. Enemies defeated in the name of Jesus. Come on, some of you need to declare that over your life. Enemies defeated in the name of Jesus. God is fighting for me. Come on, repeat that. Repeat after me. God is fighting for me. He's pushing back the darkness. He's pushing back that darkness for me. And I cannot be shaken. I cannot be shaken. Because in the name of Jesus, because, enemies are defeated. Because in the name of Jesus, the enemies are defeated. And I'm going to shout. And I'm going to shout. And I'm going to sing. And I'm going to sing. And I'm going to lift my hands. And I'm going to lift my hands. I'm going to bow my knee. I'm going to bow my knee. I'm going to worship Jesus. I'm going to worship Jesus. I'm not going to agree with the enemy. I'm not going to agree with because I plead the blood of Jesus over my life. Because I plead the blood of Jesus over my life. And over my family. And over my family. And I will rise victorious. And I will rise victorious. Through the blood of Christ. Through the blood of Christ. Amen. Because he is defeated. The enemy is defeated. We've got to, we got to grab a hold of this confidence that we have in Christ. That's what the word says. We've got to grab a hold of That's the right. confidence of who we are. That's right. As Christ. Man, I, if 
feel like we're in a moment. I think we need to sing this, this bridge again. God is fighting for us. Because, man, the, the week comes and the enemy tries to push us down. He tries to get us to agree with him. My mom taught a couple of weeks ago. Do you align your words and your thoughts with the enemy who says you can't? Who says you're stuck? Who says you've been defeated? Or do you align your words and your thoughts with Christ, who says you are the righteousness of Christ. You're above and not beneath. You're my son. You're my daughter. You're heirs of the kingdom of God. You're ahead and not beneath, yes. So let's sing this again. God is fighting for us.
growing up and even into my adulthood so I just feel like the Lord is just saying that you got a choice you got a choice if you're gonna see life is half full or if you're gonna allow the Lord to fill you up completely choices to press in there is a sweet presence of Jesus here right now and you can choose to put those negative condemning thoughts down even though bad stuff happened to you we shouldn't live in that we can't live in that that's where Jesus came to set us free allow. Tell the Lord if you have to, I welcome you to fill me up. I invite you to fill me up completely, Lord, with your spirit and your presence, your Holy Spirit filling me up. I invite you, I welcome you, I allow you.
What you're singing it's 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 not the physical building when we're saying let the praises fill our temple we are the temple of the Holy Spirit the Word of God tells us if you belong to God then you are the temple of the Holy Spirit and what we're doing we're singing this song let our praise let our praise fill us what's going on inside of us let the inside of me, let my soul, let my spirit be filled with the praise of the living God. See, this is what we need to do, church. It's important for us to have, because what this is, this is intimacy with God. This says you know your God. Be at peace. God knows you. But it's important, church, for us going forward. We must know God. We, you must know God. And, and this comes in intimacy, it comes in this place of worship. There are times where you lift your hands, you take a bold step, and you close everybody else out. And you let the living God fill your mind, fill your heart. For some of us, this is the only place in the house of God is where we can experience this because we're, we're unwilling to yield at home. We're distracted by what's going on in the house. So this is a great opportunity, church, to allow the Spirit of God to speak to our hearts. He's not condemning you. Bible tells us that we boldly come before the throne of grace and it says to receive mercy that's the first thing that's the first we come in before that we come before the throne of grace and we receive mercy from God that's the heart of the father to you that's the heart of father God to you his people he says, I love you with an everlasting love. Yes. He says, I love you more than you know. Because he says, my love for you is not going to fade away. The love of the Father is not like the love of man that can change. God's love for you is an everlasting love. So we can boldly come before his throne. And in this time right now, church, before we go into communion, we receive mercy. So this is what we're doing. We're worshiping God. We're saying, Lord, let your presence, let our praises fill this temple. Let your presence fall upon my heart and mind right now. Holy Spirit, have your way in us. Let our hearts cry be open to say, Lord, have your way in me. All those other distractions, all those other cares, just put them aside, church. All those limitations, all those weights. Just begin to put them aside right now. The Spirit of God is here. He's here. And as we mature, we understand He's with us always. But let's be real, church. This is the time that most of us have this moment in our lives when we come to the house of God. It doesn't have to be that way, but 
Remember, this is the mercy of God. This is the mercy of God. So, Father, we come before your throne of grace. Our bodies may be here on earth, but by the Spirit, that's where we are. We've come before your throne of grace. And, Lord, we receive mercy. We receive mercy. And, God, in your goodness, in your mercy and your loving kindness for your people, Lord, help us to find the grace that we need. Let us find grace to help us right now. Lord, I pray, let each one, let each one find the grace that they need for their lives right now. Whether it's healing, whether it's broken relationships that need to be restored, whether it's families that need to be repaired, marriages that need to be strengthened, relationships, finances, whatever it might be. Father, let each one find the grace that we need to help us. Your grace is sufficient. Your grace is more than enough. Your grace is the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in us for every good work. Father, I just pray your strength over each one. Your grace, it's available. Help us to find it, Lord. I just had this overwhelming sense when we were just praising that, singing that part. Let his praises fill our temple. That as you were praising him in your temple, and everybody was lifting their hands and praising him. You were pleasing to God. You were pleasing God. And I had this overwhelming sense that he was working in your life, like filling you with, as you're praising, he's filling you with love. And I just, this overwhelming love upon each of us this overwhelming sense of his gentleness and his kindness. And he said, he said, buddy, I love you. And he said, Irene, he said, I love you. And he said, Diana, I love you. And he said, Gloria, I love you. And he said, Rick, I love you. Brandon, he said, I love you. He said, I love you. Bill, he said, I love you. Everybody in here. Jamie and Sharon and Susan and Carolina and Jennifer and Mary, like everybody. He just this overwhelming sense of I love you. And some are still seeking, some are still not quite sure, some are looking, not knowing, you know, kind of blinded a little bit, not knowing. But he was just filling you up and saying, I love you. I love you. As the word of God says, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we would be called children of God. That's what the word of God says. It's a promise. It's a promise for you. What kind of love is this that the Father loves you in this way? Sister Isabel, I hear the Lord saying for you, He's prepared, He set aside grace for you in this season. I hear the Lord say to remind you, you are not alone. The Lord says that he wants you to be reminded that he would never abandon you and that when you look over your life and the seasons that you've gone through, the Lord says, I've been with you the whole time. As you've looked back, as you've seen, even in difficult trials, you've seen God provide and make a way for you. Amen. 
So the Lord says, in that same way, in that same way that I have made a way for you, the Lord says, I'm going to continue to do so for you in your future. The Father says to you, my daughter, don't be dismayed at the things that you have around you, the things that you face. But Father God says to you, he says, my daughter, I already know what you have need of. The Lord says, just trust me in this season and see if I will not deliver you. See if I will not make a way for you because I love you. My hand is for you. And the Lord says, I'm providing for you. I'm providing for your family. I'm making a way. Even though it might not seem, in your mind you might say, God, how are you going to do this? And the Father says, nothing is too difficult for me. So watch and see my hand at work in your life. Does that make sense? Amen. Father, I, pr I bless, I pray over Isabel. I ask that you strengthen her. Lord God, let her be reminded of your goodness and your mercy. Let her see your hand and the faithfulness of how great you are, living God. In the name of Jesus. Thank you. Let's just prepare for communion right now. If you need communion elements, just lift your hand and somebody will come. It's part of our worship. Because he loved us. We do this in remembrance of him because he loved us, because he gave his grace, because he poured out. And we want to remember him. The Bible says it over and over to remember all of his benefits. This was his greatest benefit that he gave to us, his death on the cross. We thank you, God. We remember your body that was broken. I could never pay the price that you paid because you have so much more love than any of us here, Father God. But we do this to remember you, to tell you that we love you. God wants to hear that from us also. He wants us to tell him that we love him. We thank you. And remember to examine ourselves before taking the bread. You can just repent right there for anything if you need to. Just examine yourself. And it says, while they were eating, Jesus took the bread and he blessed it. Bless it, Lord. And he broke it, break the bread, and he gave it to them. And he said, take, this is my body. And then he took the cup and he gave thanks. Lord, we thank you for this blood. And he gave it to them and they all drank from it. And he said, this is my blood of the covenant which I poured out for many drinking. The covenant that he made between you and I. That if we will profess and believe in the name of Jesus, he will set us free and we will have eternal life. Thank you, Father God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. We remember you and we tell you that we love you in Jesus' name. So, Lord God, thank you so much for this time and worship. Lord, we thank you for family here today. We thank you for a wonderful day. Thank you for this church, Lord, that you've planted us here for a purpose. We just give you glory in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, worship team. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. It is a good day to be in the house of God. Amen. Amen. If you're sitting by someone that you don't come with, can you turn to him and just say, welcome. Welcome to Life Church of Orange. <laughs> so good to see so many smiling faces. Is it just me? Does it smell like morning breath because we've been singing? <laughs> we've been singing today, huh? It's been good. Maybe it's just me. <laughs> Maybe it's my morning breath. I don't know. <laughs> 
I'm going to go over some announcements with everyone today. Um, and uh, we got a lot of really great stuff coming up this week um, and a special thing going on even later today. Um, but before we get into that, so uh, this week we have Tuesday night prayer this Tuesday, June 6th from 6 to 7 p.m. You don't want to miss this. You want to come out. The power of God hits us in the room. We're, we all pray together as one body that's united. You know, last week I talked about the Holy Spirit, how he knits us together, and, and that there's a need that we must come and pray together, that we must fellowship with one another. So you're not only fellowshipping with one another, but we're praying together. So it's a great time. Um, you don't want to miss it. Tuesday night, six, uh, June 6th, 6 to 7 p.m., um, and then Thursday morning, Bible study. Every Thursday morning at 10 a.m., we have a Bible study, and we go over what was taught um, on Sundays. Um, it's another great time to fellowship and get into the Word. Um, that was another one of my points this past Sunday. We, the disciples they, and the believers there in Acts 2, they got together, and they uh, devoted themselves to the Word of God and to learning it, to, to understanding doctrine. And so that's what we do on Thursday mornings. Um, Friday night fires. We just had our last one. Um, Friday night at our house. It was awesome. If you were there, you were blessed. If you weren't there, well, I don't know. You might have been blessed. <laughs> but we prayed for those that weren't there. Um, and uh, we've had some different uh, people that have been sick. And so we prayed for them. And Pam and Bill are back in the house of God. And Aiden's also back. He was sick last week as well. And so it's good to see breakthrough and, and God just healing and uh, keeping, keeping our family safe. Um, this coming Sunday, really excited about this one. We have church in, it's a church picnic, church in the park. I was going to say church in the picnic. <laughs> church in the park. It's awesome. If you guys were here last year when we did it, it was such an awesome time. We all brought our food, um, and ate afterwards and we listened to, uh, you know, the, the word being taught and, uh, we all just grabbed our our chairs, and it was just such a great time. Um, and I think the weather is going to be nice, too. It's going to be too hot, so um, that's good. But basically, it's going to be June 11th, this Sunday, at Irvine Park, right up the street. We're going to be in Lot A, and I think there's a graphic. Yep, if you can see where that red, it's kind of small. So the park entrance is right there. So right as soon as you get through the park entrance, and it's 5 bucks per car, you get through and you turn left, and then right there on lot A is where we're going to be. Um, we're going to be kind of across the little street, but if you make it to lot A um, where the parking is, you'll find us. So come this Sunday. Don't come here. Come there at 11 a.m. is when we're starting. So you guys should come sooner, set up your, your stuff that you want to set up, and uh, bring food, bring a cooler packed with goodies, and maybe even some goodies to share, um, and drinks, and... Um, you know, water balloons and all that kind of fun stuff and squirt guns and <laughs> baseballs, footballs, frisbees, all the stuff. Bring it all. Um, and we're going to have a great time fellowshipping with one another and uh, just being with one another. And Danny is coming That's this Sunday. He's going to be here this week. So Danny Dunn from Fresno, from Bread of Life. Um, he's come with Tom a lot of different times. Him and Sarah are coming. Um, and so they're going to spend some time with us. And uh, so you really want to be there to get to know them. They are just blessed people. They, God has given them gifts um, that um, they're going to pour out on us. And it's going to be a great time. So you don't want to miss that. And then also, uh, we had it this morning. But every Sunday morning, we have pre-service prayer that starts at 930 in the morning. Again, we want to devote ourselves to prayer. We want to be a church that is known for praying. We want to be a praying church together, not just on our own, but together. And so at 930 every Sunday morning, we're here in the sanctuary. Vicky's playing amazing, beautiful, anointed music. And we're just praying and agreeing for the service, agreeing for what God is doing and all those kind of things. Um, and then the last thing, but not least, uh, we have this prayer card. There it is. If you have this with you, I want you to wave it at me. There's like no one that has it with them. Wah, wah, wah. Um, it's okay. This card, we had them out on all the seats last week. And what this is, is it's from Harvest Crusade. Um, and it's really awesome. It's, it's kind of what we've been talking about as far as, you know, bringing people and praying for people that are lost, that need to be in the house of God. And so we asked um, that you would write down four people that you're praying for. 
um, that need to, to meet Jesus, that you would write those down and that you pray for them. And so I just want to remind you of that, um, to write those names down to, even if you don't have the card, go home, write some names down, or if you have a notebook with you, write some names that come up on the top of your head right now. Write some names down that need to know Jesus and start to pray for them. Doug's got his. Um, there's, oh, there's some cards in the back that Doug has. So uh, maybe after the service, you can bug Doug. He'll, he'll get you some cards. <laughs> um, all right. I think that is it for the announcements. And what I want to do and what we're going to start to do, some different things, but I want to go over some, some vision and some, um, I'm calling it the focus, what we as a church our, uh, our focus is, and, and so there's three kind of main points. You can see them on the screen. We wanna, I want to share with you what we're working towards as a church, what we're believing for, and what we're praying for. And so there's these three different things. So what we're working towards as a church, what I want you guys to start thinking about um, is opening up to one another in a deeper way through relationship. We've been talking a lot about you know, these different opportunities to come in fellowship with one another and to, to love on one another. And the reason is that we want to serve one another. We want to live with one another and love one another as family. You can't be a family if you're not living with one another. And what does that mean? It means that we fellowship with one another, not just Sunday mornings for the short time in between, you know, coffee and the service starting or after the service is over but throughout the week and so that's why we have all these opportunities to come here to to come to prayer to come to thursday morning bible study to come to friday night fires uh, church in the in the park is going to be a great opportunity to fellowship and love on one another and um what we want to do is is we want you to get involved and that's what we're working on we're working on getting everyone involved and what that means is we're involved in each other's lives. We're involved in the different parts of what our church is doing. And um, that involvement means that we're not, partic- or we're not spectators anymore, but we're now participators. That's a lot. That's a, that's a responsibility. So we want to, we want to n- not just come to prayer, but we want to be praying. We want to start um, you know, coming up and sharing what God's put on your heart because each one of you has something special that God's put in you to share with one another. We need you. It says that the church is a body, and it's like if each, each person is a body part, well, I, I, I need my eye. If I'm without my eye, I'm half blind. <laughs> and one of you is an eye. <laughs> one of you is an arm. One of you is an ankle. One of you, every person here is essential to the body of Christ. Okay, so that's what we're working on as a church. Um, the next thing is believing for and want to see happen. Um, we are wanting to see what we're believing for is that we would be, um, that we are starting to build this church and strengthen Life Church of Orange for the greater purpose of building the kingdom. That's the goal, right? We want to build the kingdom. And so first we want to strengthen this house so that we can start to send out, so that we can start to impact the community. But if there are things that we need here, how do we impact the community if we still need to build this up and strengthen this up first, right? So that's what we are believing for. We want to, we want all of you to take ownership of the building. If you see something, you're like, oh, that would be great if that was different. Bring that idea, submit it to Pastor Gabe, and then do it. Don't just dump the idea off because Pastor Gabe's one person, right? He can't do it all. And so we need each, and he may not know how to do it. (laughs) Exactly. Um, And so we need each person to, to bring what they got and to take ownership of the building and to do those things. Um. You know, I'm going to brag on someone, you know, we had, uh, there was a need for, uh, you know, some painting to be done. There was some scuffs and some different things, and somebody um, paid for the building to be painted. That is taking ownership, and God bless them. And so, you know, different things like that that need to be done. We, we need to have the heart to be able to either give towards it, organize it, figure it out, and do it, and build the church up. Um, we're also believing for finances and increase. We need to be praying about those things. We need to, um, you know, prepare for the harvest because God has placed us here in Orange for a purpose, like I was saying. God has placed us here in Orange to impact this area, not just to be a standalone church that 
is four walls and nothing else happens outside of that. We want to impact the kingdom of God, the community for the kingdom of God. And so that brings us to what we're praying for as a church. What we're praying for is that God would give us the tools and the resources to reach East Orange and impact the community for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that is our overreaching goal. That's what we're trying to get, to, get towards and work towards. And so we want to be praying about that right now while we're building up the house, while we're um, you know, building each other up, while we're growing as a family, while we're opening up to one another because we can't impact them until we're open to one another. Because how, do you, how are you open to strangers if you're not open to one another, right? And so we want to grow. You know, I think even last week I was like, turn to someone and say, you're coming over for dinner. Did anybody come over for dinner? Oh. <laughs> come over for dinner. You can come to my house. <laughs> Seriously. So we want to open up to one another so that we can build the house, take ownership, and then impact the community for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Awesome. So what that means is we need resources. The Bible calls us to tithe. Malachi 3.10, it says, let me get there real quick. It says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. This is God talking. And thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down such a blessing until there is no more need. Or another uh, translation says that there is not room enough to hold it. God is saying, test me. So bring the tithe that there may be food in this house. That way we may be able to feed others. Amen. And receive others. So that's what the word of God tells us. So if any of these things sound interesting, awesome, or sound like you know something that you can jump in or be a part of, give towards it. But not just your tithe, but give an offering towards it. Over and above the tithe. God just asked for 10%. Give a little bit more for those things. But also, not just money, give your time. Give your heart. Give your prayers. Give your focus to building up the kingdom of God through building the church, through relationship to one another. You know, there's, there's lots of different things that, that, that need to be done here. We have a youth room full of a bunch of gear that we need to create a work day and have a bunch of people come out and organize it and do all that. And so those things are coming in the future. But so that's another way that we can serve. Another way you can serve is you can start talking to some of the leaders and, hey, how do I get involved in this? How do I get involved in that? Become a door greeter. Become someone who helps out with ushers, taking out the trash, all these different areas, right? So I just want to encourage you in all that. And if you're giving today, uh, we have the Church Center app. You can jump on there and you can give through the Church Center app. You can also place tithe in the box. There's a little brown box back there. Um, or by mailing in a uh, check or cash or however you want to do that. Um, so those are the three different ways to give. All right, we're moving on. You guys ready? I'm so excited. If you guys haven't been able to tell that already. <laughs> I'm going a million miles a minute. We have Mike Chamberlain in the house. And he's going to give us an awesome word of God today. Always love it when Mike teaches. You know, he is, he, he's got the gift of teaching. And so we're, uh, we're really excited to have him. And I just, I, just, I love your kids, Mike. Your kids are They're awesome. All right. They're, They're all right. right. They're all right. <laughs> kids are awesome. They're up on the worship team with us. And so, but it's good to have Mike. Amen. Maybe I should just give my notes over to Jordan. He could preach it since he's, he brought the energy today. And yes, I love my kids. We have a wonderful church, don't we? God's doing great things. I love the lyrics of one of the first songs we did today. Never does a day go by without him by my side. He never walks away. He is with me. It doesn't always feel that way, does it? Sometimes it doesn't seem like he's by our side. Even when he is, he seems far off, and sometimes he seems silent. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Like what Becky mentioned a couple weeks ago, sometimes in our Christian walk, we feel stuck or defeated. We're in a wilderness time. As we look at the vision of this church and as we move forward, 
God is taking us maybe corporately and maybe individually out of a wilderness time. We're going to be looking at Deuteronomy 8 today. We're, I'm going to read the whole chapter. Uh, so this message will only be about three hours. Okay, so get the notebooks that uh, Becky gave you and you can take some notes. Um, yeah, okay. You know, in 1 Thessalonians 5.14, it says, Admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, and help the weak with patience for all. And so for some of us who've been in a wilderness time, God wants to encourage you today and help you understand why you're in this season. Sometimes we're in a situation, right, where we're saying, why is this happening to me? This seems so meaningless. This seems so pointless. Has anyone been there before? Yes. Maybe some of you are there now. I know I'm in a little bit of a wilderness season myself. And so today's message title is why we wander, walk, and wait in the wilderness. Okay, you got that? So you need to take notes for that one. Why we walk, wait, and wander in the wilderness. I've been really blessed the last couple of years. I've traveled with my family throughout the Southwest and done some camping in New Mexico, and we've went to the Grand Canyon and other places. And when you're out in the wilderness, I think I have some images here, do I? I mean, that's, I think, Death Valley. And it's a beautiful place, and, but it's also a stark place. Your lips could crack. You can become very dehydrated quickly. And a place that seems beautiful can also seem foreboding. My brothers came out west. Well, my twin brother was living out here at the time, and my little brother came, and they went out for a hike. And they were just having a great time until they got lost. And they started wandering, and they ran out of water. And when that happens, a fun day can turn pretty scary pretty quick, can it? And it can be like that with our Christian walk or our spiritual life at times. Uh, I'm from New England, but don't, don't hold that against me, okay? And I remember I had a wonderful idea to take my whole family to a walk in the woods in the winter, and it was started to snow. And guess what? In the snow and in the woods, everything looks the same. Thankfully, I'm such a spiritual guy. I did not panic. I did not say any bad words in my mind or my mouth. <laughs> Actually, when you get into a wilderness situation, in a quick life or death situation, what's deep in the heart comes out, doesn't it? And you find out who you are and what you're really made of. And in a metaphorical way, some of us are in the wilderness. We're going to look at a literal time when Israel was in the wilderness, but maybe some of you are in a career situation or a job situation or job loss, or maybe you have some educational challenges. Maybe you're just lacking direction. Maybe you're in that kind of wilderness. Or maybe some of us are in a relational wilderness. Maybe we have an estrangement with a member of our family, or maybe we have dysfunction in our relationships, and there's a cycle that keeps repeating. Have you ever been there? I think all of us can relate to that. Maybe there's a physical ailment. Maybe someone in your family has passed, and you're mourning. Maybe there's some mental or spiritual illness. Maybe you felt the calling that God had on your life, and it feels like it's just not coming to fruition. Have you been there? When we're in that place, we're saying, what is the point of this? And what God wants to do, because this is Moses preaching to the children of Israel after they've been wandering for 40 years, and he's explaining to them, you're about to come out. You're about to go into your promised land, but let me explain to you why you've been in this time of wilderness. So that's what God wants to share with you. So let me, I'm going to be reading from ESV. I apologize if that's a different translation, but it's, it's from the Hebrew. Don't worry. And we're going to read all of Deuteronomy 8. And I'm going to focus on verses 2 and 3 for our message. Sound like a plan? Yeah. Okay. Deuteronomy 8. The whole commandment that I command you today you shall be careful to do that you may live and multiply and go and possess the land that the Lord swore to give your fathers. Verse 2. 
And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what is in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord." Your clothing did not wear out, and your foot did not swell these 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, the Lord your God disciplines you. So you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and by fearing him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs, flowing out of the valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive trees and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron, and out of whose hills you can dig copper, and you shall eat and be full, and you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes which I command you today. Lest when you've eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, and when your herds and flocks multiply, and your silver and gold is multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart will be lifted up, and you forget the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions, and thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you water out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna that your fathers did not know, that he may humble you and test you to do you good in the end. Beware lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand has gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth, that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day, and if you forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly swear you today that you shall surely perish. Like the nations that the Lord makes to perish before you, so you shall perish because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God. Let's pray. Wow, Lord, that's really sobering words. And God, for some of us who are not in a wilderness, sometimes we get prideful in our successes. We forget that you are the one who's allowed us to prosper. You are the one who's given us gifts and abilities and talents. We pat ourselves in the back, but Lord, you're the one who has given us these gifts, and we recognize you today and honor your name. And for some of us, God, we're in a wilderness time. Some of us are wandering. We don't even know where we're going. But God, I pray you would stir in our hearts and remind us, Lord, who you are and that you are with us, and that there's meaning in this difficulty. There's meaning in this fruitless time, this waterless time that we may be in. Encourage our hearts with your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about verses 2 and 3 of, of Deuteronomy 8. And there are three reasons why God puts us into the wilderness. Maybe we can go to the next slide if we have it. Okay, next one. Okay. Why is it that God puts us in the wilderness? When we look at verse 2 and 3, it says, You'll remember the whole way the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you. That's the first thing, humble you. You know, God, our God does not like proud people. Our God does not like it when we're full of ourselves. The word of God says God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourself before God and he will lift you up. God says, I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior and perverse speech. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. So the first reason why God allows us to go through difficulty, challenges, it is God who takes us into the wilderness. Now, little caveat. Sometimes we sin ourselves and we put ourselves in the wilderness. But many times we are in the wilderness. Jesus was led into the wilderness. He didn't sin. 
Caleb was in the wilderness. He didn't sin. So sometimes we have to go into the wilderness for God to humble us because if our hearts are not humble, he won't use us. And so when we're going through a tough time, we think it's meaningless and we just want to get out of it, right? Right? Don't we just want to just get out of it? But we have to step back and see, okay, God, you're doing something in me. You're, you're taking all the idols down from my heart, and I'm depending more on you so you can fill me up and help us to do the vision that God has for us individually and through this church. You know uh, Joseph in the Old Testament, right? Didn't they make a musical about him? <laughs> Technicolor dream coat? I'm sure it's very accurate, right? But he was someone that God gave a vision to. He says, I'm going to use you in this way in leadership. And being like the tattletale, smarmy kid he was, he was like, I'm dad's favorite. Dad got me this coat, and he didn't get you this coat. And I'm going to rule over you guys. You ever have a little brother like that? Don't answer it, okay? So Joseph had a call from God, but he was full of pride, wasn't he? And so what did God do? God had to humble him. His brothers pretty much left him for dead, sold him into slavery. He was falsely accused, and he was rotting in a jail, accused of a crime he didn't commit. And what happens? He's probably pleading with God, and he kept his faithfulness, but so there's the, the cupbearer and the cook were thrown in from Pharaoh. You know the story. And um, Joseph in the prison, is like he, God uses him to interpret dreams. And then he tells them after, and so like the, the cook and the cupbearer are like, oh, thanks, I won't forget you. I got you. I'm going to go back to the Pharaoh, and I'm going to get you out of here. And what did Joseph think? You think, yes, it's going to be over. You know what happened? They forgot about him. And so he had this glimmer of hope from God, how God used him. And for some of us, you're in a situation or you've been in a season, and you felt a glimmer of hope like Joseph did. And you thought, I'm about to get out of this wilderness. Am I speaking to anyone? And you think you're about to get out and your heart's broken again. Or you, you seem disappointed. But I want you to know that God was faithful to Joseph. And that God completed what he had started. But he was still working in Joseph's heart. Moses, he's the most humble man alive. How? Because God put him into the wilderness. He was a prince of Egypt, and then he went to Midian, and he was a shepherd for 40 years. So for some of us, when we're in that time, when we, we feel that God is, he wants to do something through us, he's given us a dream, and you might feel, my time has passed me by, or maybe God has forgotten about me. He hasn't. He has not forgotten what he put in your soul. Now, we can cooperate with God's will, and I'll explain later how we can maybe expedite getting out of the wilderness, but sometimes it's just God's timing. How about Paul, the Apostle Paul in the New Testament? You ever hear of Paul? Yeah? yeah? All right, just making sure. Did he, so he's on the road to Damascus. Jesus himself blinds him, okay? He's, he went from someone who is persecuting the church to someone who submits to God, and he ends up writing two-thirds of the New Testament through the Holy Spirit. What happened? He gets converted, and then what happens? He goes right and starts writing and preaching? No. What happened? God took him into the wilderness for three years. The wilderness is God's way of humbling you. So the first reason why you might be in a wilderness season is that God is humbling you because he wants to use you. Amen? All right. Second reason the scripture says, why does God allow us to go into the wilderness? Because he's testing you. He is testing you. He's testing your heart. Of course, God knows what's in your heart. But you don't know what's in your heart. And sometimes God is revealing this gunk that is, needs to be surfaced in your heart. Uh, my wife Jennifer and I, we do a lot of um, premarital counseling of couples and they want to get married. And, you know, part of that job is to reveal things that are hidden because people are in love and, 
you know, when you get married, it's a sanctifying process, isn't it? <laughs> what that means is you find out what's really in your heart, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And it, it can be a real challenging time, but with the light of Christ and the help of God and good local church, what God's doing is he's sanctifying and cleaning out your heart. Well, the same is true is that when you're in a wilderness time, you're finding out what's inside of your heart. And a testing time is normal for all the great ones. All, everyone in the Bible goes through a, a testing time. And you think of Job in the Bible. And what happens is Satan comes up to the throne room of God and says, you know, the only reason why this guy Job follows you is you've blessed his life. And if you, touch, if you just touch his body or you touch his riches, he'll curse you. And so God allows the testing to happen. And for many chapters, you find out what's in Job's heart, good, bad, and ugly, and his friend's heart. And through this season of life, God allows a sanctification and a cleansing process of the heart. And of course, you know the end, Job ends up in a better spiritual place, even a better financial place. Of course, there's tragedy that is only resolved in heaven I'm not making light of it, but we want people to be tested. If you've ever had a medical procedure or a surgery, do you want your surgeon not to have taken any tests? Well, I think it's the appendix, but I'm not sure. It could be your lung. All right, let's just go for the liver. I'm feeling, I'm hearing the word liver. Okay, so it's just a, like, that's kind of weird, right? Well, my nephew, he just got his pilot's license, so... I'm glad he was tested. I'm glad he has his hours. So in the natural realm, for licensing, we want people to know what they're doing. Yeah. Don't we? Yeah. Well, God wants you to have a heart that is submitted and humble. And so that's why he allows us to go into this testing season. So he tests you. It's a refining fire so that you'll be strong for what is ahead. There's no one who ever goes into battle that's not been trained. Anyone who joins any branch of the military, uh, there is a time of testing. Okay, think of the Navy SEALs or whatnot. There's a time of testing to get someone into a position where they're strong enough for when the battle comes, they're not just going to run in the other direction. And it'll become second nature. They'll know what to do. And so part of what we're doing here is training. And so we have to look at our wilderness time as not meaningless pain in a fallen world, although that's part of it, but it's also our training ground that God is using these afflictions to train us to be his people so more people can enter the kingdom of God. Amen? So the pain and the testing in the wilderness and the seemingly dry time is not meaningless. So the first reason why... Um, God brings us into the wilderness is what? To humble us. The second reason is what? To test us. What's the third? We don't live on bread alone. Is that he wants us to understand that we need to be dependent on the word. It says in verse 3, And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Sometimes I don't hunger for God, but I need to hunger. And sometimes God provides in ways that just doesn't, it, it just doesn't make sense. Is uh, I've been in a wilderness time, but it's, it's not a serious wilderness time, but it's, it's not easy. Everyone has their stuff. Uh, when I was in my 20s, I thought, oh, or maybe I was a teen. I don't know. I thought, it'll be cool someday. And I only share this not to say, oh, here, I'm having my uh, therapy at your expense. I just share this to say I'm walking this out too. And I also share this that everyone has their stuff. And some, everyone's issues are different. Some are very serious. But I, when I was in my 20s, I was like, oh, career-wise, I want to be a professor. That would be really cool to be a professor someday. So, you know, you go to school and you study and, you know, I went to Japan for a year and then tried out teaching and it was good. I went to grad school, did all my 
papers and stuff, had a little fights with the grad professors who were using the Lord's name in vain, but God got me through that. Um, then I ended up teaching, and the, they start off, you're a lecturer, and then you have to jump through a bunch of hoops, and then you're an assistant professor. Oh, you're not really a professor. You're an assistant professor, even though you're doing professor things. Then you're an associate professor. You jump through a bunch of hoops. This, take, this is like 20 plus years, okay? Finally, I become a full professor. You know, I, I got my PhD. I was going to school full time, being an elder in a church, working full time. I was like, all oh, this toil. So I finally get a letter that says, you are now a full professor. Dun, 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 dun. It's all about titles. No, it's not. This same year, okay, so I get this title. It's like, oh, it's a dream come true. A couple months later, we're letting you go. So you get, you get a letter of, you know, that they, they, they're downsizing and so on. So I've been in this, this space of, like, sending out just job application after job application. Where are we going to go? Are we going to live in Taiwan? Are we going to go back to the East Coast? And uh, I remember I just had a job interview and I was interviewed by someone, like I used to be doing the job interviews. You see what I mean? It's super humbling. And I'm like, you know, this is my dad's term. I'm like, this is a little Mickey Mouse school. You know, it's like not very professional. And it's like, how does this person have power over me now? And now I have to suck up to this person. Don't you know who I am? You know, all this like pride in my heart swelling up. It's like, oh my goodness. And then we're trying to figure out, well, how are we going to make ends meet? And it's just a, it's a humbling time and you're trying to figure out and do some calculations. Then we get a letter, this, that same day we got a letter from the landlord. The rent went up for $200 more a month. I'm thinking, of, and then, oh, it's just like, God, what are you doing? I'm just feeling challenged. Like, how are you gonna provide? But the manna story, God provides in ways you don't understand. Uh, I'll just brag on my son, Ezekiel. I'm proud of all my kids. Isaiah is also a really great debater, but he did a speech and debate tournament. The same weekend, our rent went up. I was feeling pretty low about things. I was like, what is, this is so discouraging. So he does this debate deal down in Irvine. Long story short, through a series of events and his hard work and diligence, he wins this tournament and he gets a huge scholarship at this university. So, yeah, good work. But he, he will tell you, and, I, and, and it, it's just from God's grace because, like, the person who usually wins, he, he gave his debate and his, like, presentation kind of collapsed at the right time. And so you have, the, you have these, like, high rollers that are, like, I was like, oh, wow, I'm not allowed to pray, you know, curses on other people's kids. I know that much. So, but, um, no, it's good. These are all great people. God just opened the door for him, and I was thinking, no matter how I would calculate it, God's going to get me through this season. Do you see what I mean? Like, I'm losing my job. I'm, I don't know if, how we're going to afford certain things, but God is still with me, and he provides, like, manna in ways that I don't expect. But when I'm in a challenge, I do stupid things because I hunger. Don't, don't you have ways you try to satisfy your hungers that are not godly? I, I mean, we all do it to some degree. I'm stupid enough to root for the Boston Celtics. Those chokers. Laker fans, you didn't do so hot yourself. But we, we all medicate in our own ways, right? When we go through tough times, a lot of us, we try to sedate ourselves through different types of medicines, whether entertainment, whether alcohol, drugs, or just just foolishness, phones. God allows us to hunger and sometimes come to our end to realize this stuff doesn't satisfy. We read, we sang this song today, living water flow, drinking from your well, nothing else satisfies. You are the water that brings me life. So when you're in a wilderness, that's when God is awakening us to the fact that we really hunger for him. In Orange County, there's a lot of people that are just drunk on earthly things and that pat themselves in the back. But in the end, where will they be when they stand before God in judgment? Do you know what I mean? And we are his people. And it's not wrong for God to prosper us. 
but we just don't pat ourselves on the back. But whatever God gives us, we use for his kingdom. Amen? So the third reason why God takes us into the wilderness is to show us our dependence on his word. Think about in Matthew 4. This is a crazy verse, I think. Um, Jesus tests in the wilderness. Look at this. It says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Is that crazy? Jesus was led by the Spirit. Okay, so the Holy Spirit leads Jesus in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Wow, thanks a lot. I mean, that's like an earthly thought, right? I mean, Jesus is Jesus. He's doing it right. And so God leads him into a wilderness. Not only does he lead him into the wilderness, but he allows him to be tempted by the devil. You know, our, our high priest has been tempted in every way that we have, yet without sin. But look what Jesus does. He quotes from Deuteronomy 8. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came to him and said, If you're the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Wow. So, you know, if Jesus is led into the wilderness by the Spirit, don't you think some of us are going to be led into the wilderness by the Spirit? But he, he's, God is with us in that time. So when we call out and we cry out, God, why is this happening to me? That's a good question to ask. But then his word explains that even as we're doing right, sometimes God takes us into the wilderness. Amen? So do you want to learn how to pass the test when you're in the wilderness? Let me first tell you how to fail the test. Okay, Okay, you know what? As a professor, people always want to know how to pass the test. But let me tell you how to fail the test. Okay, the first way to fail the test is to grumble. If you don't want to pass God's test in the wilderness, just focus on the trial and wander aimlessly. Wander around aimlessly and complain about it. That's a good plan. I know you would never complain, would you? I I, I certainly would. I certainly wouldn't. Maybe Marcus would, but I mean, where's Marcus? Oh, come on. That's not right. Okay, Marcus, please forgive me. Okay. All right, so... Listen to this. It's like the people began to complain about their hardship in hearing the Lord. When he heard them, his anger was kindled. Can you imagine? God brings all these plagues, kills the firstborn, delivers them out of Egypt. And what do the people do? Wow, man, I miss Egypt. They had better eats over there. You know what I mean? I want to go back there. Oh, my goodness. Now, We've already established that I have wonderful kids. So I'm going to tell you hypothetical kids, okay? These are hypothetical kids, okay? Every, okay, I'm talking about your kids, okay? <laughs> there might be a kid that says, man, I wish we had a bigger house. I, you know, this is a, you know, I wish I had this more space. I wish I had this or that. You know Calvin and Hobbes? That's like an old comic book. This, uh, this character, his, this six-year-old, his mom would spend all day cooking this food, and then she'd serve the kid, and the kid was like, ah, oh, what is this slop, you know? If you're a dad or you're a mom or a guardian, and your kid, after you slaved away for them and you served them and put a roof over their head, and they just said, ah, oh, this place stinks, how do you feel? Huh? Yeah. Get them out. Get them out. All right, you're out. Um, Okay, I I talked about hypothetical kids. Let's talk about a hypothetical dad. There might be a hypothetical dad that hypothetically explains rent and says, okay, go for it. Do you know what rent is in this region? (laughs) How much, what, what is the cost of living, okay? Go for it. Hypothetically. What's my point? We do the same thing to God. We don't thank God for what he's given us, what he's taken us through. Hey, I'm, I'm just like you. We all do it. 
but we have to remember, okay, God, this stinks. I don't like this situation. I wish it was like this, but God, you're good. You've got me through this. Please get me out of this, Lord. And But you can have humility in your heart and recognize God is training us. God is allowing us to go through this, but we remain in a posture of thankfulness. Because I want to give a warning. L look at 1 Corinthians 10 up here. It says, avoid idolatry. That's like obeying false gods, right? Idols. That's pretty bad, right? If you had this false god and we were all bowing down to it, how do you think God would feel about that? Pretty bad, right? Yeah. I mean, that's like Christianity 101. You don't even have to read the Bible. You probably already know that. Is that God says, like, you'll have no other gods before me. Second commandment, no idols. So idolatry, that's big time sin, right? Sexual immorality, big time. Big time sin, okay? Complaining? Look at the third one. Which one of these things doesn't belong here? They all belong there. Idolatry, immorality, complaining. See, God hates a complaining heart. So we have to really check ourselves when we're in that place because for a lot of the children of Israel, they complained, and guess what? They died in the wilderness. It is possible for us to elongate our wilderness through complaint and by refusing to learn and to be trained. So we have to be careful that we could, if we could complain and grumble our way into death in the wilderness. I'm just the messenger. But I'm convicted by this as well. All right, let's, let's, let's get a little more bright in here. How to pass the test. Okay, let's pass the test. You guys want to pass? Yeah. All right. We got to walk by God's word. Uh, Deuteronomy 8, 6, you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in his ways and fearing him. So we want to walk by the light God has given us. Sometimes we don't know how God's going to get us out of a situation but we just keep walking, even if we don't see far ahead of us. I really wish God would just show me the plan. But actually, when you think about it, if God showed us all the plan, we might not even take the first step. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's true, too. I mean, that's a different message for a different day. But, um, but then sometimes God's very gracious, and he only shows us what's in front of us. We support a missionary um, in, the, in the past from here, uh, from Zimbabwe, Sydney. And he used to, he, he, that country is in a different development level than our country. He used to hike over this mountain to, <laughs> to go on dates, basically, to see his fiance at the time. So he's climbing over this mountain, and by the time he comes back, it's, it's nighttime. And he would just have a lantern, and he can only see three feet in front of him. Have you ever been in pitch black black? Okay, if you've been, like, camping, it's, it's a little scary. And sometimes our life is like that is that God shows us a little bit of the path. And you don't know when you're going to be home or when you're going to get out. And it's an it's a act of faith for you to keep walking and not to panic and not to scream like we were talking about earlier, like when you're in the wilderness. And some people, the promise is right around the corner, but you don't know it. And so you quit and you die in the wilderness. And we don't want that. So we keep the commandments and we stay grounded by the word, and we depend on the word of God, and we just let his word be a light to our path. Um, and then the other thought is that we have to wait on the Lord. It says in the word of God, those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They'll mount up like wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So there's another principle that sometimes... We're in this wilderness time, and it's just not your season yet. It's just not your time yet. Um, I hate Valentine's Day. <laughs> like, where does that come from? No, I mean, I was teaching my, my students, my classes, and it was, I was like, you know, you always try to work with these first-year students and keep them coming to class. And I said, hey, if you come today, I'll tell you why I hate Valentine's Day. I was like, oh, don't worry. I'm, you know, all you Valentine people that love it. It's like, what are you talking about? It's like June now. Well, like, why are you talking about Valentine's Day? Because I, I gave a little speech about it. But the point is, is that sometimes these students, it's like singleness awareness day or single awareness day. And people feel like this external pressure, whether it's prom or Valentine's Day or all this stuff. 
and they're feeling like, oh, what's wrong with me, or where am I? And I just want to, I encourage them, and I said, Ecclesiastes 3 says there's a season, you know, there's different seasons in life. And it could be that the season just hasn't come, that you're in the wilderness and you're waiting for some sort of breakthrough, and maybe it's just not your season. Does that make sense? So you, you think about um, Jesus in the book of John, and they're saying, why don't you manifest your power? Why don't you just take over? And what does Jesus say? My time has not yet come. Even Jesus is submitted to God the Father's timing. And so throughout Scripture, there's always a theme of God's time. And we have to patiently wait on the Lord. So if we want to pass the test when we're in the wilderness, we walk by his word and we wait on the Lord. Um, Caleb was like that. Caleb was wandering in the, in the wilderness. Not wandering, but he was walking in faith in the wilderness until God let him out. And he was one of the only ones from that old generation that had strength and vigor, and he took his promised land. God kept his promise because Caleb was faithful when the others were not. So that's how you pass the test. So those are the reasons why God takes us into the wilderness. Why? To humble us, to test us, and to show our dependence on the word. We pass the test by walking by his word and by waiting on God, waiting on it. And then finally, for those of you who are not in a time of wilderness, I would encourage you to reach out and pray for or minister to or just do a blessing for someone who is in the wilderness at this time because we're all going to be there and God gives us a warning in, in, in verse 17. I already read it, but beware lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand has gotten me this wealth. Many of us, when we're in a time of fruitfulness, we just give ourselves all the credit. And when we do that, we're full of pride. It doesn't mean that you don't work hard. It doesn't mean you don't deserve some of these things. Proverbs says that if you're diligent, there's always a benefit. There's spiritual things at work. But your artistic skill, your intelligence, your linguistic skill, whatever you have, did you create those things? God put those inside of you. The musical skills, you know what I mean? Your job is to cultivate it and to grow it and be a good steward of it. But you can't just say, I'm a great musician because I made myself a great musician. There's some truth to that, but you, you know what I mean. God is the, there's some people that can work as a musician all their life, and they just don't have it. I'm sorry. You know, I'm not going to be an NBA player. I'm sorry, okay? <laughs> I, think, I think my time has passed there. But we have to give God his glory. Does that make sense? Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your word. Thank you that when we're going through a wilderness time, it's not pointless. It's not meaningless. That you're there with us. And like in this passage, it could be that you're going to take us into a promised land, into a new fruitful area. But God, you want to do great things through us individually. You want to do great things through us as a church. And we recognize that this, these times of affliction is humbling us so we can be used by you. It's testing us so we can confess the sins inside of us, so we can be filled with your spirit. And God, forgive us when we don't depend on your word and on your spirit, Lord. We try to fill ourselves with other things but forgive us for doing that. We are dependent on your word and your spirit. Help us not to grumble. Help us to walk by the light you've shown us. And help us to wait on you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I almost lost my footing there. Praise God. Michael, God bless you. That was a great message. I, I uh, believe that all of us are encouraged here this morning. Just a reminder, prayer Tuesday night. Come on out, 6 p.m., uh, 10 a.m. Bible study. Uh, and then uh, next Sunday, 11 a.m., we will not be meeting here. We will be meeting at Irvine Regional Park. 
come on out, be a part of what we're doing. You're going to get to know each other. This is how we do this. It's important for the church to fellowship. It's what the Word of God tells us, right? Acts 2.42, the Word of God, fellowship, uh, communion, and then uh, prayer. So these things, this is what we're doing in the church of God. Come on out. We love you. God bless you. Have a great week, and we'll see you.